We now turn to the set of cases dealing with political party primaries. Uh, and just as political parties are not mentioned in the Constitution, uh, primaries aren't mentioned in the body of the Constitution either. Um, and that's because primaries are uh, sort of a later development and the notion of a, mi of a party primary akin to what we have uh, today really developed over centuries um, as the political parties developed. And so uh, one of the challenges, as mentioned in the first discussion about uh, political parties, is to think about uh, whether the political parties are uh, private associations or state actors. And so this lecture uh, deals specifically with the cases which grappled with that problem, dealing with um, the deprivation of the right to vote of African Americans in Texas uh, to have a say in the Democratic Party uh, primaries there, the so-called white primary cases. And so before we jump into those particular uh, cases, let's let me just say a few things about party primaries that will be applicable both to this, this lecture and the next one. A party primary can often be the, the dispositive election uh, for a particular congressional district or state. In a, a party primary's power or significance is often a function of how much political competition there is in a state or a district. So for example, if you live in a district that is 80% Democrats, um, the general election is probably foreordained if the only way to get on the, to the general election ballot is to win a party primary. Uh, and so the party primary is often going to be the most important election that chooses uh, the final candidates that are going to emerge and to get that office. And that's true for a large number, if not most offices in the US because uh, we are so politically segregated. So one party or the other usually has uh, the, the, the upper hand when it comes to the general election. And so the primary uh, will often be dispositive. For the most part, primary rules are the product of decisions jointly made by the two dominant parties, the Democrats and Republicans, uh, decide what the rules are going to be for their primary elections. Um, sometimes, though, the people, through the acting through the initiative process, might regulate uh, parties or primaries uh, by, uh, you know, by by passing a law um, uh, at the ballot box. Um, but often, um, the rules for party primaries are determined uh, by the Democrats and Republicans uh, through negotiation. And so, there's a kind of strange. Uh, problem here as to you know whether these rules are actually the internal rules of the political party or whether they are um, the state law. The answer is that they they you know both operating at the same time. That you'll have rules about the primary election that are specified uh, by state law, but then you also have internal rules of the political parties as to uh, the appropriate um, ways to manage a party primary. And so the white primary cases are the sort of uh, classic cases to decide what a political primary, a party primary is. Is it um, just the decision of a private association or is it uh, like a general election, state action that implicates the right to vote and other rights uh, related to the voting process? And so when does a nomination method become state action? Um, it might be that if you didn't have parties as uh, participating in uh, an electoral process, that clearly then the primary, like the general election, would be um, would be state action. And when we say state action, what we mean is that it then becomes uh, subject to all of the obligations and restrictions that the Constitution uh, provides for other kinds of state action that the government engages in. And so uh, if you, for example, just ran a primary election like you do in, say, a student council race, where you start with 10 candidates and you winnow it, it down to two, what would be known as a nonpartisan primary, that that has the same kind of rules uh, that we dealt with with, say, the ballot access cases or the other right to vote cases, that uh, when parties are not involved, um, that it's just an election like any other run by the state. But when parties are involved in the decision of candidates who will then appear alongside their name on the general election ballot, uh, you know, what are the factors that should determine whether the party's influence is um, seen as state action and potentially subject to constitutional restraints? And as we walk through the party, the white primary cases, it might be useful to think about the, the factors as either formal or functional. And but what, I, that, what, I, what I mean by that is that is the party uh, uh, sort of functioning in a particular way? so that it really is exerting the same kind of power that it would if it were just the state regulating a, um, an election. And so that uh, is, the, is the party functionally in its effect 
uh, so powerful in terms of being a gateway to the general election ballot that we should attach certain constitutional obligations to it. So that's one way of thinking about it, is just looking at the power of the party and, and the function that it is serving in running an election that will be necessary to choose uh, political leaders. But you can also just have some formal tests here, like who is funding the election? Is it being funded by the um, by the state? Uh, are there political uh, are there elected politicians who are administering the election? These are more formal characteristics as opposed to functional characteristics, which uh, focus on the uh, power of the political party and whether it's exerting power akin to that uh, of the state. The white primary cases are. Uh, either 14th or 15th Amendment cases. And the question here is whether racial discrimination in the primary election is uh, constitutional or not. And so the rights that are implicated either are um, uh, lodged under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment or under the 15th Amendment's prohibition on racial discrimination with respect to the right to vote. And so as we go through the cases, the court sometimes strikes it down under the 14th Amendment, either under the suspect, usually under the suspect classification prong of the 14th Amendment, saying that racial discrimination violates the Equal Protection Clause. But in other cases, it's going to uh, strike it down under the 15th Amendment, saying that the right to vote uh, has been deprived here on the basis of race. And while that might seem like a kind of subtle distinction, you know, these days, almost anything that would violate the 15th Amendment would also uh, violate the 14th Amendment. The, 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 the decision to go with either the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause or the 15th Amendment's prohibition on racial discrimination with respect to the right to vote hinges on whether you think the right to vote as prescribed in the 15th Amendment is implicated by a primary election. Because if it is merely racial discrimination not implicating the right to vote, then the Equal Protection Clause might be uh, what you would use. But if you agree that this is actually a deprivation of the voting rights that are uh, envisioned by the 15th Amendment, then uh, you could then the court sometimes will go with the 15th Amendment as the reason for striking it down. And at the risk of fast forwarding to the end here, I want to just uh, tee up a question that should be in your mind as we think about the white primary cases, which is sort of what are the implications of these now sort of old cases for the way we think about political primaries today? Uh, do they stand for the proposition that political parties are state actors and that primaries are state action in all of their incarnations? Or is it sort of, are these sort of a unique set of cases dealing with the conditions um, that African Americans were facing in Texas um, in the middle of the century of the 20th century, um, because it might be that the court was sort of engaging in a little bit of rough justice here in order to try to prevent the Texas Democratic Party from uh, depriving African Americans of the right to vote, uh, but that the same rules might not apply to um, say the minor parties today or to even the Democrats and Republicans where you might not think that in all of the various things that they do that uh, the constitutional requirements for primary elections would apply to them. The white primary cases uh, read almost like a series of law school hypotheticals um, because through six cases that went up to the Supreme Court, the court dealt with all the different strategies that the Dixiecrats in Texas had adopted in order to try to immunize their primary election from the basic requirements of the 14th and 15th Amendment. And so uh, the cases start with Nixon versus Herndon in 1927. In that case, there was a specific statute on the books in Texas, which deprived African Americans of the right to vote in the Democratic primary. And the court struck that down under the 14th Amendment because in the teeth of the law, the law actually had a racist classification that was built into it, just as it would be unconstitutional to specifically say that blacks and whites have to go to different schools. So to hear uh, a, a law that says that blacks are not allowed to vote in the Democratic primary was struck down under the 14th Amendment. Uh, in Nixon versus Condon, uh, the, the Texas Democrats came back with a different law. Instead of having sort of the racism right in the teeth of the law, right sort of specifically phrased, they said that um, each state's executive committee of a party will then be able to determine the qualifications 
of uh, for voters who can vote in that primary. And so uh, it didn't uh, it sort of was one step removed from the kind of statute that was in Nixon versus Herndon and um, uh, delegated that power to the state executive committee, which then um, basically came up with rules that deprived African-Americans of the right to vote. And the court said, look, that's too clever by half. You, uh, that is also unconstitutional because the state executive committee of the, of the party, uh, because you are vesting it with that power uh, by virtue of state law, is a state actor for these purposes. And so that also violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause for the same reason. So not uh, uh, deterred by these Supreme Court cases, the Texas Democratic Party came back again. And this time um, they delegated uh, in, in, the, in the statute, the statute said that the state party conventions will have the power to set qualifications for who can vote in political party primaries. And here in Grubby versus Townsend in 1935, the Supreme Court upheld uh, that power of the state party convention to discriminate against African-Americans with respect to voting in a party primary. And so you might ask the question, what's the difference between say an executive committee or a party convention? And, and, and here, I, I think the court was trying to get at really the, the critical issue in all of these cases, which is at some point, um, the political party is behaving more like a private association and is more the rights of its members, as opposed to um, being an agent of the state, like it was when it delegated the power to the executive committee. Now, you might think that that's kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a slender reed on which to hang this kind of constitutional distinction. But uh, for the court, there was, you know, there had to be some place on the slippery slope where they wanted to dig in their heels. And so the difference between the state executive committee, which was seen as a state actor in Nixon versus Condon, and the state party convention in Grubby's versus Townsend was a way of making that uh, distinction. Now, one of the interesting things about the white primary cases is that in the middle of them, right after Grubby versus Townsend, other cases uh, came through uh, and reached the Supreme Court that dealt with the question of whether voting in a primary uh, implicated the right to vote. And so there was this interesting case called U.S. versus Classic in 1941 in which the, the, it's not a d discrimination case, it's not even really um, you know, a primary access case, but it was a question as to whether ballot box stuffing in a primary election uh, implicated the right to vote. And the court there said in a, in a criminal prosecution, yes, that does implicate the right to vote. Now you might say, well, what, why is that relevant to the question of whether the Texas Dixiecrats are state actors or not? And the answer came uh, three years later in this case called Smith versus Allwright, where the same law that was upheld in Grubby versus Townsend, the delegation to the state party convention to set the qualifications for primary voters, that was now struck down. And, it, and the court said that this intervening case of U.S. versus Classic was uh, the reason. And so why would that primary ballot box stuffing case um, uh, change the, the landscape? And the court said that basically, um, because we have decided that the right to vote is implicated um, by a primary election in which ballot box stuffing is, is depriving people of their voting rights, we've now made a decision that um, the, all the trappings of something like the 15th Amendment, which says that the right to vote can't be denied because uh, on, on grounds of race, um, that that then is triggered in the context of a primary election. So the delegation to the state party convention to determine uh, the qualifications for voting in a primary, that implicates the right to vote under the 15th Amendment. And so therefore, um, uh, we are going to say that this the delegation, which we previously upheld against constitutional challenge, is now unconstitutional under the 15th Amendment because when the state party convention deprives African-Americans of the right to vote in the primary, um, it violates their right to vote on grounds of race, uh, and that's a protection of the 15th Amendment. And so not to be undone, this, the Dixiecrats in Texas came back again, and they um, started holding, or at least factions of the party, started holding kind of pre-primary elections. You think of this as like um, little meetings in garages and, and around the state, uh, and there were two factions in the party, the Jaybirds and the Woodpeckers. And so the question here is whether these private meetings or seemingly private meetings that that nominated candidates who would then be the, the Democrat on the Democratic ballot, uh, the primary ballot, um, is that state action? 
And that, you know, that, that raises really difficult questions because at, at, there has to be a point at which five people meeting in their living room, it's not state action. Um, but the court here said because of the way that this Jaybird primary was um, being conducted, that it also was state action uh, that violated the 15th Amendment. Here, the court uh, came up with a kind of fractured decision as to why that Jaybird primary uh, was unconstitutional. For some justices, it was critical that um, there were actual um, political officials, elected officials who participated in that primary. For other justices, it made a difference that the function of this primary was to essentially determine who the Democratic nominee was going to be. Again, that's more functional as opposed to a formal uh, uh, way of deciding what the whether the primary was state action. Um, but in the end, even those pre-primary meetings were decided, uh, determined to be state action that implicated the 15th Amendment, and so the court struck it down. And so from all of these uh, cases dealing with party primaries, we come up with a kind of set of factors uh, as to whether a primary election is state action. It's hard to say what, you know, which ones are dispositive and which ones are just sort of weighing in favor of um, state action. Clearly, as Nixon versus Condon made clear, a state law that specifically has um, uh, racial discrimination uh, it, it mandated in the party primary, that is classic. Uh, state action, um, whether it was in the election context or elsewhere, a state law is, um, is is clearly going to be seen as implicating constitutional rights. And then later, the delegation of responsibility to a seemingly private actor like a party committee or a party convention, that also is going to uh, implicate state action. And so if there's a formal requirement in the law that a particular actor on the outside is going to um, determine uh, qualifications, even that is going to uh, implicate um, um, the 15th and 14th Amendments. Um, but then when we move from sort of state law or explicit state delegations, we get into sort of more iffy factors uh, as to uh, what determines whether a party primary is state action. Um, in Smith versus Allwright, some of the justices, the, the court says uh, that, that state control of the primary process is enough to uh, determine that it is uh, state action. Uh, in, um, uh, in in Terry versus Adams, uh, Justice Black and Justice Clark say, look, look at the place of the primary in the electoral scheme. If the primaries were a part of the machinery for choosing officials, um, then the, that the pre-primary involved a duplication of the state's election processes and the state-sponsored primary merely ratified the results of the pre-primary, that is going to be dispositive as to whether the Constitution attaches. Um, Look at the voter qualifications. Do, are they the act, exact same as they would be for the primary election, except for the fact that they uh, prohibit African-Americans from participating? That uh, sort of coincidental voter qualifications might be seen as uh, contributing to state action. And then for others, uh, other justices like Justice Clark and Terry versus Adams, look at the substantial political effects Look at again, this is a functional determination where the pre primary election was an election in which public issues were decided or public officials were selected. It was the only election that really counted for 50 years. And the effect of the pre primary plus the primary system was to strip African Americans of every vestige of influence in selecting officials. And then finally, are there um, sort of implicit state, state sanction or the participation of state officials in the primary? If elected officials, so to take off, try to take off their official state action hat, and then as private officials uh, or for private uh, citizens try to run these pre-primary elections, uh, is that uh, uh, something that would count against the law uh, in saying that or against a, a primary election, uh, so that it would say it would be state action? So um, in uh, even Justice Frankfurter, ordinarily a uh, advocate of judicial restraint, in Terry versus Adams says that officials panoplied with state power clothed with the authority of the state and charged with conducting elections, voted in the pre-primary, which itself was a device to defeat the primary. And so if uh, elected officials who other who normally are, um, uh, you know, acting in their formal state capacity, if they are uh, running these elections, then that might be a factor uh, pointing in the direction of state action. Let me conclude uh, by just saying um, that 
the, the primary the white primary cases are one of a, are, are one set of a series of cases where the court has dealt with the question of state action and don't deal with most of the others in this course. Um, but but the strand of state action doctrine that comes from the white primary cases is um, summarized as when a private actor is performing a f function that is traditionally exclusively reserved to the state, that sometimes that can lead to a determination of state action. And both of those adverbs are important, it's traditionally exclusively uh, performed by the state. And so that elections are traditionally a state function uh, and exclusively so. Right, that 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 when you're choosing political leaders for a country, that that is traditionally and exclusively a function performed by the state. So when a private actor like those in um, in Texas tries to run a parallel process of what is traditionally exclusively a state function, the court may uh, find that to be state action. Now that doesn't mean that political parties are state actors in all of their many incarnations. Um, there are things that a state par a party may do outside the context of a primary election that might not be determined to be state action. Also, you know, the, the unique circumstances of the Texas Democratic Party in the 1940s, 50s uh, and earlier, uh, you know, we don't know whether those same rules would apply uh, to parties today, whether the, the Democrats and Republicans today or the uh, uh, minor parties. So, for example, could you start a feminist party that uh, excludes men? Could the, there be a Black Panther Party that excludes whites? Um, minor parties might not have the same power as the major parties in determining and uh, in, in affecting the outcome of elections. So should they, as more like interest groups, have um, greater First Amendment rights to determine um, the processes that they're going to uh, apply. I should say, uh, in um, a much later case, the court did determine that uh, the party primary in Virginia, in a case called uh, Morse versus Republican Party of Virginia, was uh, state action that implicated the Voting Rights Act. So we do have some uh, more recent cases where the white primary cases are deemed to be relevant. Um, but these other questions about in what context is a party um, a state actor and are all parties considered state actors, no matter how small they are, really hasn't been uh, answered. Now, just as one concluding note and as a transition to the next lecture, just because we say that a party primary might be state action in the context uh, of, of the sort of Dixiecrat, Dixiecrat disenfranchisement of African Americans uh, in Texas, doesn't mean that everybody has the right to vote in every party's primary. And so there was a district court case called Nader versus Schaefer in which um, a plaintiff said, look, I'm not a member of the Democratic or Republican Party, but I think I have a right to vote in those party primaries. And they cited the white primary cases. And the argument was that, look, the uh, where I live, uh, the Democrat or Republican Party primaries are the dispositive primaries in order to choose election officials. And I, as a voter, have a constitutional right to vote in a primary, in any election, in which that, that is going to be dispositive and functionally determine who the elected leaders are going to be from my uh, from my particular location. And the court rejected that. And it's not a hard case uh, for us to sort of um, grapple with or for the court to grapple with. But it did raise some important questions about the reach of the white primary cases. Um, and it distinguishes and, and sort of forces us to ask whether the kind of qual what kind of qualifications can a party impose for uh, voters that are going to vote in, in its primary? If you can, if you're not allowed to exclude people on the basis of race, why can you exclude people on the basis of party? Now you might say, well, of course that's what a primary does. It's about uh, limiting itself to uh, the particular members of the primary, so that then they could have their leader be on the general election ballot. But if primaries were seen as state action, for the same reason that you can't discriminate against Republicans and Democrats in other areas of life. So, for example, there is a whole series of patronage cases in which uh, you can't hire or fire certain officials because of their political party affiliation. Um, for the, for the same reason that in those cases, state action might be seen as violating First Amendment rights. So to here, you could say that um, preventing, uh, say, an independent voter from voting in a Democratic Party primary could be seen as violating their either uh, First Amendment rights or their right to vote. But as we'll see in the next set of uh, cases, uh, that's not where the court has, has gone. In fact, if anything, the court has uh, protected the rights of political parties to determine uh, outside of the context of race who's allowed to vote in their party primary elections.